I'm sorry for screaming. We, uh, there was an oversight. Over we forgot to bring in the sign-in sheets. So we'll, we'll just uh, ask you if you can remember to sign off for this week when you sign in next week. And, uh, right, we'll make a start then. I'd like to welcome Dr. Sukim Lee, who is curator for Tate's Asian Pacific Acquisitions Committee, and is focused on expanding Tate's cultural and geographical commitments. Sukim was previously an exhibitions and displays curator of Tate Liverpool, curating exhibitions such as Nanjun Pei in 2010 and Doug Aitken for Source and Thresholds in 2012. And before Tate Liverpool, she was Arts Council of England's Curatorial Fellow in Cultural Diversity, curating a number of exhibitions that included Lee John Wan, Regular Fragile, which was at Oxford Hall, Kira Kim, Palace of Mirages, Julian Opie in the 1990s, and Modest Monuments, Contemporary Art from Korea at King's Lynn Art Centre. Sukhya was a curator at the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Korea, where she organized exhibitions such as New Venture, Korean Young Artists, Michelangelo Pistoletto, and Distinctive Elements, Contemporary British Art. She was also a part-time lecturer at Hong Yi University in Seoul and guest lecturer at Sotheby's Institute of Art here in London. She has written for several exhibition catalogues as well as for a variety of international art publications. And recently, uh, last year, contributed an essay for The Power of Now, the Real Art. So please welcome Dr. Sukhyun Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, very kind introduction and for making this opportunity to introduce the students here. And thank you all for um, making time to come to this lecture. I hope that this uh, talk will entail some elements of uh, questions and answers at the end to discuss the issues I address during the talk. Um, in December last year, a major exhibition of Chinese contemporary art opened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, titled as Incarts, Past as Present in Contemporary China. The exhibition showcases a number of key contemporary artists such as Xu Bing, Ai Weiwei, Zhang Wan, Song Dong, and Wu Wenda. The museum's introduction of the show indicates a few questions related to the representation of non-Western art at Western art institutions, as well as the distinct and often independent practices within museum sector between historic and modern and contemporary departments. It reads, quote, the first major exhibition of Chinese contemporary art ever mounted by the Metropolitan, in card explores how contemporary works from a non-Western culture may be displayed in an encyclopedic art museum. Presented in the museum's permanent galleries for Chinese art, the exhibition features artworks that may best be understood as part of the continuum of China's traditional culture. These works may also be appreciated from the perspective of global art, but by examining them through the lens of Chinese historical artistic paradigms, layers of meaning and cultural significance that might otherwise go unnoticed are revealed. Ultimately, both points of view contribute to a more enriched understanding of these artists' creative processes." Unquote. Taking ink, the primary medium of painting and calligraphy in China during the past two millennia, as the starting point, this exhibition follows the challenges and alterations this medium faced from the um, 1980s to the present day. Here, ink stands for something that is uniquely Chinese, while also signifies an aesthetic that is historical and traditional. And Xu Bing's work is one of the um, artworks included in this show. However, the emphasis on the expansion and subversion of the medium shows a possible convergence of two seemingly opposing contexts, the traditional and the contemporary. The exhibition's curator, Mike Hearn, the Met's curator in charge of the department of Asian art, explains, quote, this exhibition is simply my response to what is happening in the contemporary art world. 
I wanted to look at modern Chinese art from my traditional perspective, but I didn't want to include artists who are merely continuing traditional idioms. I wanted to discover artists who are extending, <coughs> challenging, or subverting tradition. So I began to look beyond works of ink on paper, expanding to photography, video, oil on canvas. Really anything that retained what I call the ink aesthetic. So the photographs by Ai Wei, Ai Wei, Wei like provisional landscapes, and ink animation by Chuan Xiong uh, were also included in this context. There has been a long history of engagement by European and American museums with pre-modern Asian art. Curators like Hearn are part of this legacy, where the well-established curator of divisions between traditional Asian art and modern and contemporary art face new challenges when dealing with contemporary Asian art. While the development of historical Asian art in Western museums has been bound up with an image of Asian culture as other to that of the West that privileges the ancient past. The departments of modern and contemporary art have begun addressing increasingly diverse global art practices. In the context of encyclopedic museums, the rise of the department responsible for contemporary art is a relatively recent development, which raises a number of questions about the hybrid nature of contemporary art coming from Asia and other non-Western regions. The history of contemporary art is fundamentally paradoxical. Uh, there are increasing numbers of critical discussions and scholarly writings about contemporary art, and therefore they range from the sociological and geopolitical to the philosophical and theoretical. The lexicons of psychoanalysis, post-colonialism, post-structuralism, feminism, identity politics, and so forth have entered the discourse of contemporary art, and in terms not only of its interpretation and dissemination, but also of its creation and production. As I just mentioned, numerous art institutions and departments within museums dedicated to contemporary art are also emerging rapidly and widely, along with periodic contemporary art festivals, including biennials and triennials. On the other hand, the very nature of contemporary, which resists historical discourse, makes attempts to historicize contemporary art futile and flawed. When the object of study is still in progress and in flux, reasoned or detached judgment are neither possible nor appropriate. Instead, delineating the specific context of the present becomes an urgent task, and the emphasis on an idea of the historicity of the present increases. Another axis contributing to the complexity of the study of contemporary art is the ever-increasing geographical boundary of emerging art. The impact of globalization and the evolution of post-colonial theory have created an urgent need to acknowledge and address art produced in areas beyond North America and Western Europe. The socio-political conditions of the present in these areas vary widely, thus resulting in diverse and pluralistic practice which requires an approach that is contextualized and specific rather than formalist or universal. These formally marginalized emerging centers of contemporary art often have a complex and disruptive relationship to the history of modernity, and this can pose a challenge to and ambiguity in understanding their present. Therefore, it's necessary to in, uh, integrate the contemporaneity of histories from around the world with a temporal encasing of historical narratives in order to develop a natural trajectory that is capable of incorporating the spatial dimension of the contemporary. Ruptures and discordances are inherent in such a trajectory, and the very notion of linear history is questioned envisioning time as a multiplicity. In this sense, the contemporary self can be understood as a rupture in periodization, being a period whose distinctive nature undermines the notion of coherent history. The art of the new era, what we call contemporary art, 
embraces not only the perceptual mode required by the art of the previous decades, but also the social political reformation of hegemonic orders. Not merely the contemporary um, art contemporaneous to our time, contemporary art involves new modes of understanding the temporal and spatial conditions of the contemporary. So going back to the discussion on the position of contemporary art, Asian art in Western museums, the conventional distinction between the historic and the contemporary can no longer be sustained, at least not in its current form. The hybrid nature of the art practices in most Asian countries in the 20th century complicates and expands Western-centric canonical understanding of modernism in art, paving ways for articulating multi-centered plural modernisms. I shall now talk about contemporary Korean art as a particular example for discussing shared conditions and statuses of art in Asia. The inquiry is not oriented to the making of history, but to making sense of a history that is becoming. I aim to understand the present not as the end of history, but as a representation that bears the contradictions of contemporary experience, as well as the ambivalence and unpredictability of the present. So my approach is bound up with a specific place of Korea and the specific time of the present, but it's not intended to view contemporary as a mere reflection of a specific moment. Rather, I am interested in identifying multiple points of historical connection that question linearity and didactic contextualization. Addressing temporal and special paradigms of contemporaneity is particularly crucial in understanding contemporary Korean art because its trajectory is intertwined with the history of art beyond Korea, while specific to its own local history. Contemporary Korean art, which has received a great deal of recognition in the past two decades in particular, is often perceived and presented as a coherent national grouping. Numerous large-scale exhibitions have been held internationally, such as Across the Pacific, Contemporary Korean Art, and Contemporary American Art at Queen's Museum of Art in 1993, Facing Korea, Korean Contemporary Art 2003 at the Yapel, Campus International Art, Form Photography Museum in Amsterdam, and Netherlands Video Art Institute in Amsterdam, and Montevideo Time-Based Art. Elastic taboos within the Korean world of contemporary art at the Kunsthal Wien in 2007. Peppermint candy contemporary art from Korea at the Museo de Arte Contemporanea de Santiago in um, Buenos Aires in 2007 and 8. And Your Bright Future, 12 contemporary artists from Korea at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Museum of Fine Art, Houston, in 2009-2010. Both domestic and international art markets have also boomed, partly due to a rapidly emerging Chinese and other Asian art markets. An unprecedented number of independent exhibitions and alternative spaces can now be found in Seoul and other large <coughs> Korean cities, and there is a strong network of publicly funded artist residencies, open to both Koreans and foreigners, thus encouraging a direct and wide global network, while showing an eagerness to connect to local communities. Furthermore, the audience for contemporary exhibitions have grown not only in scale, but also in demographic, ranging from artists, curators, and critics to students, office workers, young people, and families. The changes in Korean society since the late 90, 1980s have been widely regarded as a main catalyst for the vigorous development of contemporary art there. The economic growth and democratic transition around the Seoul Olympics in 1988 and the end of military regimes in 1993 created an ideal breeding ground for young practitioners whose, ambitious, um, whose ambitions embrace a truly global pres 
prospect. Democratic movement of the uh, 80s, following the Guangzhou uprising in uh, 1980, reached a pivotal phase with a new era of civilian government and the prosperity of an export-led economy. Opening up a promising age of Sege Huang, roughly trans translated as globalization. For the first time in recent Korean history, ordinary people could travel abroad without restrictions, and arts graduates began to pursue postgraduate studies in foreign countries, notably in such traditional artistic metropolises as New York, Paris, and London. Um, it was not only Korea that was experiencing this kind of shift in the late 80s and early 90s, of course. The fall of Berlin Wall and the revolutions in Eastern Europe in 1989 and the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the Cold War, signaling a new world order based on economic power relationship. Globalization characterized by the incorporation of neoliberalism into the mainstream became the new environment for many growing economies. While the post-Cold War ideological vacuum began to be filled with the post-colonial engendering of multiple and simultaneous centers beyond the topological boundary of the East and West, or the triplet of first, second, and third world, Viable alternative social, political, and cultural scenarios began to reconfigure the conventions and systems of artistic creation and circulation, and the conditions of contemporary art became increasingly heterogeneous and lateral as a consequence of migration, decolonization, and globalization. Technological advances and the integration of digital culture on the global scale also accelerated the emergence of new forms of both art and spectatorship. The new communication and information technologies of the internet and the development of the World Wide Web provided the means for a virtually direct and diversified interactivity within the art world. The art of decolonized alternative centers have found a number of new ways in which to interact with the art world in the past couple of decades, in particular in the context of the proliferation of large global exhibitions in temporary context, that is to say biennials, triennials, art fairs, and so forth. The impact of this has been significant, not only in terms of the reach of the exhibitions themselves, but also on the production and distribution of art. Korea alone hosts a number of such events now. The Gwangju Biennale was established in 1995, closely followed by the Busan Biennial in 1998, originally titled the Busan International Contemporary Art Festival, and the Seoul International Media Art Biennale in 2000, also known as Media City Seoul, and several other focusing on specific media, including craft and photography. On the one hand, these exhibitions are intended to bring the Western art world to Korea, and on the other, they are meant to create an alternative focus bypassing the Western mainstream system. In either case, they have paved the way for Korean artists to interconnect and engage with the international scene directly enabling them to speak the international language without cultural translators or perpetual relatedness. When the art of former peripheries is introduced to still dominant mainstream arenas, it is often presented as an exhibition type based on themes of nation, culture, and ethnicity, an approach that is undoubtedly bound up with a unilateral modernist nation-state paradigm. The emphasis is typically on contemporary art uh, capacity to reflect the conditions of its creation and the assumption that a group of artists coming from the same environment share similar concerns which are expected to be largely geopolitical and cultural. 
Such expectations are rarely imposed on artists in the Western art world, however, where terms like postmodernism and post uh, neo avant garde, neo dada, have been perceived as adequate enough to address the latest development within the existing boundary of modernist discourse. Perhaps one exception was the uh, 1990s phenomenon of young British art, YBA which emphasized the shared sensibility of a generation of individuals as nationally specific. However, the rise of practitioners such as Daniel Hurst, Trace Daniel, Rachel White, and Mark has successfully dissolved the once beneficial term and established these artist practice as integral to the vicissitude of Western art after modernism. The difficulties around thinking about contemporary Korean art stem from many contexts, including historic, political, economic, social, and cultural ones. While the country's recent history is naturally entangled with the world history, its particular development in artistic and cultural terms requires specific interpretation. At the same time, however, the art of contemporary Korea can only be fully understood within a wider paradigm of neoliberalism and globalization that is restructuring the world at a remarkable speed and to an astonishing extent. The rest of this uh, talk is an attempt to understand contemporary Korean art in the context of contemporaneity that is indeterminate yet specific. The genealogy of contemporary Korean art goes back to the mid to late 1950s, when a large number of artist groups were established by emerging practitioners, including the Modern Art, the Contemporary Art Association, and the Creation Artist Association, all founded in 1957. Since the end of the Korean War and the nation's division into the North and South Korea in 1953, there has been a resurgence of uh, the founding of fine art faculties in the South um, newly established growing universities, producing a new generation of artists. Um, while the notions of art and fine art were introduced as largely Western and modern ideas during the Japanese colonial period, which was from 1910 to 1945, it was not until then that the Korean artists community seriously explored the ideas of modernism and the avant-garde as core issues of contemporary art. In a 1968 exhibition catalogue, um, critic Yi Gyeong Sung described the 1950s group movement this way. Quote, it was around 1957 when contemporary Korean painting began to make changes. The progress of arts community faced an overall change of direction with the emergence of groups and artists who consciously explored modern art. The core of the modern art movement in Korea has been young artists in their 20s and 30s who resisted traditions. Along with these young painters, it was modernist artists who had been marginalized until then that indicated the right direction for modern art. Their avant-garde nature and attitude made it possible for them to find the right direction that correctly responded to the current of our time." Unquote. The Contemporary Artists Association included such young artists as Kim Yong Hwan, Kim Chang Yeol, Ha In Du, Jong Sang Hwa, and Park So -ho. Their negation of the established community and of the Korean National Art Exhibition, Kuk Jun, was perceived as most radical. Between 1957 and 1961, the group organized several exhibitions showing strong interest in modern art and its associated theories. Unformel became the aesthetic and formal brand for the group's practice from 1958 onwards. And further development of abstract art and counter movements by figurative artists continued in the 60s, while Korean artists' participation in international exhibitions, such as the Sao Paulo and Paris Biennials, promoted their international prospects. 
Although international exchanges were limited for Korean artists in the 1960s, there was a keen interest in the international scene. As we have seen, the understanding of modern art often grew out of visit to Paris or contacts with the art works there. Though most practitioners were also informed about American abstract expressionism and other movements through foreign language art magazines. Such a close following of international trends was sometimes condemned as a formalist imitation or ruthless worship of the powerful and became a particularly critical issue when the Minjong or People's Movement started to surface in the late 70s. There was also a tendency within the establishment, the establishment to find distinctly Korean modern art, thus reflecting a collective desire to level the field of engagement between Korea and the West. Often supported by the ideology of an authoritarian regime, keen to promote the idea of a unified ethnic identity. And such artists like Ha Jong Hyun was one of those people who tried to find what is distinctively Korean in their work. A group show entitled Five Korean Artists, Five Kinds of White was held at the Tokyo Gallery in 1975, providing a platform for Korean monochrome painting to present itself as a synthesis between national sensibility and modern expression. <coughs> In the preface to the exhibition catalog, Critic Lee uh, wrote, quote, to us, white is more than simply a color. Before it, it is a color, it is a spirit. It is a kind of universe called white before it's a color, white. Perhaps we have perceived it as a, the esprit of nature, the elixir of life and the word esprit originally meant. White is an arena of creation, that on its own embodies all possible creation. So the idea was um, favorably received by the Japanese art world, including the influential critic Yusuke Nakahara, who was the commissioner of the 1970 Tokyo Biennial, which featured under the title Man and Letter, works by such Western minimalist and post-minimalist artists as Daniel Grom, Bruce Naman, Mario Wirtz, and Hans Hake, alongside Japanese conceptual artists Jiro Takamatsu and Hitoshi Nomura. So such acceptance encouraged the Korean government to support the monochrome movement in subsequent nationalist exhibitions overseas, including second um, international art of contemporary held in Paris in 1978. Being conscious of tradition and of the characteristics of uniquely Korean art was a problematic proposal. Debate around what constituted Koreanness in visual terms reached no particular agreement, but revealed the lack of counter discourse against the legacy of Japanese colonialist aesthetics developed by Soetsu Yanagi. While the state-backed nationalist view urgently required a distinctly Korean art, critical discourse could not progress much beyond the legacy of Japanese colonialist researches, thus providing no defense for Korean work on painting against political and artistic criticism. The Korean-born artist and critic Liu Fan's position was slightly different. Li was largely active in Japan, as a key member and theorist of the internationally known avant-garde movement Monoha, which is translated into the School of Things. Originally trained at Seoul National University in Oriental Painting, Li had moved to Japan in 1956 and completed his philosophy degree at Nihon University in 1961. His profound knowledge and interest in Eastern and Western philosophies provided a firm basis for his artistic practice, as well as his writings on young Japanese artists, including Nobuo Sekine, Kishi Osaka, Susumu Koizumi, and Katsuo Yoshida, who later became the seminal figures of the loosely associated Onha movement. 
theoretical and philosophical inquiries were his main concerns, clearly conveyed in his landmark essay, In Search of Encounter, The Sources of Contemporary Art in 1970. This text explained the thinking behind his rejection of the object and the search for an interactive and phenomenological encounter between object, pure, and space. He later emphasized that Noah challenged modernism in the same way as his uh, contemporaries in the West, such as minimalism, and art Povera, in that it was a clear demonstration of the impact of the dynamic and expansive international atmosphere of the time. A great deal of information about the international art and the ongoing interest in experimentation that characterized the 1960s resulted in the rise of small movements focused on performance and installation in South Korea. Groups such as Mu, Origin, and Shinjun, formed between 1962 and 65, joined forces in 1967 to initiate the United Exhibition of Korean Young Artists, in which a new wave of younger practitioners examined and interpreted the idea of the avant-garde. While the works on exhibit varied in style and genre, from geometry abstraction to minimalist object and installations, this work, happening with a vinyl umbrella and a candle, manifested a shared interest among the participants in challenging the norms and conventions of the time. Several happenings, including um, transparent balloons and a nude, a murder on Han River, and a funeral of established art and culture by such artists like Kangbok Jin, Chong Ramzai, and Chong Chan Sung soon followed, often subtly conveying a critique of repressive social and cultural conditions. The themes of sex and death in these performances resonated with a growing sense of resistance to the oppressive political power of the time, when even the most personal and private aspects of everyday life, such as the length of men's hair and women's skirts, became the subject of harsh police regulations. In the name of economic development and a defense against influence from communist North Korea, President Park chung hees administration implemented a number of legal restrictions on individual rights, ranging from nighttime curfews and foreign travel regulations to the censorship of popular music. Artists like John Tansen, Kim Turin, Chong Gamja, and Lee Gwan Yong were central figures in a number of happenings critical of the cultural landscape, though they were not overtly political. These performance practices were short-lived, however, not only due to continued policy interventions, but also to public perception that such expressions were insane and immature, as well as elitist and irrelevant to ordinary people. The search for the avant-garde continued, however, with the founding of several small groups, once again by young artists in the early 70s including the Korean Avant-Garde Association, also known as AG, in 1968, New System, Shin Chae in, in, in 1970, the fourth group, ST and Esprit, all in early 70s. AGs of exhibitions and journals manifested a typically cutting-edge direction, with artists like Park Kun, Lee Gang So, and Shin Mun So, producing paintings and sculptures made out of unconventional materials, including soil, water, trees, stones, rope, and fabrics. They also created male art and outdoor performances, consciously adopting and experimenting with new international trends. A number of artists, including uh, Lee Yi Shin and Ha Jong Hyun, subsequently became prominent figures in the artistic establishment. Decent Tech also participated in AG's exhibitions, exploring what he calls a non-material approach to sculpture, using smoke, fire, and light, as well as elements of performance and land art. 
Maintaining a distance from collective movement, Visentech has um, since then maintained its focus on the questioning of artistic canons from a position outside the mainstream. This criticism of his contemporaries focused largely on their hegemonic logic and lack of effort in creating environments for unique vision. In 1979, a group of artists and critics formed Reality and Utterance, a collective directly challenging the artistic establishment, which they viewed as complicit with a repressive government. Their criticism had a strong undertone of left-wing political views and was not confined to the arena of artistic resistance, extending to democratic changes in the social political landscape. Their first exhibition in 1980 was immediately closed down by the government due to its socialist bias, but they continued their challenge throughout the 80s. The term Minjung, which was used for, to refer the movement, um, originally means ordinary masses, people who were being socially, economically, and politically marginalized and subjugated. Political statement as much as artistic expression, Minjung Art emphasized issues like workers' rights, the reunification of North and South Korea, women's rights, and um, democratization in general. And Hong Song Lan was one of those artists. It was also often associated with the notion of Minjok, which symbolized unified ethnicity as the core of Korean nationality, including North Korea. The Minjung movement was closely bound up to the democratic movements of the 1980s, providing imagery for left-wing publications, protest banners, posters, and strike placards. Law art forms such as cartoons and murals were favored, and several artists intentionally revitalized indigenous art forms and iconographies to emphasize national history and the native landscape. Socialist realism was also a major stylistic choice, sharing formal resem resemblances with Chinese woodcuts and Latin American murals. Oyun, for instance, used woodblock printing to present indigenous traditional themes and historical figures, as well as folk scenes. Hong Song Dam is also one of those artists. Shin Cho's History of Modern Korea series, Lee jong portrait of farmers, Park Wen Dong's colleges and photomontages, criticizing capitalist paramilitary regimes were characteristic of this collective yet diverse movement. Min jong Art faced a rapid demise when democratization and economic prosperity began to expand with the inauguration of the first civilian government, Kim Yong-sam, in 1993. Scholarship focusing on the uh, movement also emerged, resulting in such exhibitions as 15 years of Pinjong Art, 1980 to 1994, at the National Museum of Contemporary Art Korea, and Beat of Pinjong, Korean Realism, 1945 to 2005, which toured public museums in Japan in 2007 and 8. Key figures of the movement, including Kim Jong Un and Kim Yun Soo, entered the left wing Nongyeon government, heading up Arts Council Korea and the National Museum of Contemporary Art, respectively. For younger artists, the 1980s had been a period when practitioners were torn between the opposing communities of monochrome painting which dominated teaching positions at institutions of higher education and its opposite Minjong. Such a challenging environment once again witnessed the emergence of small movements, including Metabox, Nanjido, and Logos in Atos. Artists such as Kim Chan-dong, Ho Sang-gil, Bun-bum organized peer exhibitions in order to be able to represent practice that did not fit into the existing system. Newly introduced international movement under the rubric <coughs> of postmodernism attracted their interest as well. Artists in the late um, 1980s formed 
further peer-led exhibition-based groups such as Museum, Golden Apple, and Sunday Soul. Artists including Che Jung Han, uh, Lee Bull, Konak Bong, and Yong Bae manifested a new sensibility in their diverse styles and materials. One of the conditions that advanced artistic diversity at this time was the vastly increased opportunity for experiencing international art in Korea. Internationalism was becoming an urgent undertaking for society at large, whether economically, politically, or culturally, as we have seen um, Nam Dun Pai's reconnecting with Korea through Good Morning Mr. Orwell provided audiences with an acute sense of <coughs> the world. It was a, a satellite um, live uh, broadcasting linking New York, Paris, and Seoul in real time. On the 1st of January 1984, referring to uh, Mr. Orwell's uh, 1984. The government was also conscious of the need for a cultural infrastructure for the growing nation, providing new public museums, festivals, and sculpture parks from the mid to the late 80s around the Seoul Asian Games and Summer Olympics. The scope and speed of such developments were accelerated by the subsequent government's globalization strategy, as well as the artistic community's increased international context. In 1993, the Whitney Biennial traveled to the National Museum of Contemporary Art Korea, showcasing cutting-edge contemporary works by such artists as Mike Kelly, Charles Ray, Janine Antoni, and Matthew Barney. The exhibition explored issues of sexuality, race, gender, and body, which were unfamiliar and even shocking to Korean audience. The museum, nonetheless, remained determined to level the playing field between Korea and Western art by adopting a radical approach. With uh, Nam Jun Peik's advice and support, the exhibition was not only realized but attracted over 150,000 visitors over 40 days. Despite serious criticism from the artistic establishment and the local media, the show's influence on local artists and professionals was profound. The founding of the Gwangju Biennale and the opening of the Korean Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 1995 enabled a stable foundation for Korean art international exposure. From Chun Su Chan and Park Iso to Sodo Ho, Yang Hee and Neil Beck, artists representing Korea at Venice have achieved appreciation on a global scale. The emergence of global contemporary art has altered many facets of Korean art, but one of its most significant impacts seems to be a heightened sense of interconnectedness. Despite the recent worldwide financial crisis and the standardizing forces of globalization, the opportunities to be connected with a wider artistic arena and to be recognized as a valuable part of an ever-expanding, heterogeneous, concurrent contemporary scene have provided Korean artists with a base from which to operate without attracting much antagonism. On the other hand, ongoing conflict between the West and the Islamic world and the recent uprisings in the Arab countries have revealed a complex history of modernization and industrialization there, in particular the legacy of colonialism for subsequent authoritarian regimes. The political power of contemporary art is acutely manifested in many artist practice, observing and unveiling as they do the untold stories of post-colonialism. Environmental concerns and other impacts of the globalizing economy have also influenced contemporary practice beyond national or cultural borders. Perceived as a critical site of multiplicity, of geographical expansiveness and of historical depth, global contemporary art can promote cultural differentiation, which was largely absent from modernist discourse. P. 
key shift includes the emergence of new forms of political power and modes of subjectivity that encourages a radical reconsideration of change without recourse to dominant discursive models. Cultural difference and inclus inclusivity provide the potential for global contemporary art, which remains carefully distinct from a residual sense of neocolonialism or marginalization in anticipation of a more just alternative. While acutely aware of its distinctive context, contemporary Korean art is also required to be fluent in globalized artist language and its implications. What is at stake is not mere recognition or inclusion, but a regrounding of the hegemonic structure of the last few decades. With an emphasis on collective agency and plurality, globalization opens up the possibility of heterogeneous, as argued by anthropologist Ajahn Apadurai. Apadurai proposes a context contingent definition of imaginary landscape inflected by the historical, linguistic, and political situatedness of different sorts of actors, nation states, multinationals, diasporic communities, as well as subnational groupings and movements. Such a locus is where contemporary Korean art is now situated, a kind of privileged site for the formation of a new paradigm. The encounter of different cultures engender a complicated revision of discursive models. While ethno-nationalism often overlooks culture's hybridity and alterity, we are now enabled to see the complex aspect of gender, religion, and social class that constitute an individual identity in many cultures. By considering culture as a situation, rather than a finished product of an individual or collective, culture can become a useful tool when we engage in the discourse of the other, the notions of cultural identity or Asianness are no longer fixed in time or place, but exist in a condition where everything is fragmented yet interrelated. Contemporary Latin Asia is simultaneously situated in a specific culture of Asian origin and in the westernized international culture. Most artists from Asia who are prominent in the international arena create works that employ international formal lexicons, as well as culturally specific references. The balance between these seemingly opposing elements is a matter of translation, and as with any translations, a key issue is negotiations of differences. With increasing exchanges, mobility, and migration, the gap between previously unrecognized or untranslatable aspects of different cultures is narrowing. Such a trans, uh, translatability may signify an effect of homogenization brought by globalization, but it can also represent a possibility of truly multi-centered global culture, where the politics of difference no longer entail the notions of derivative or not the other enough. Thank you for listening to um, rather long talk, but um, I'd like to invite some comments and discussions. Well, I'm trying to pass the microphone around uh, for those who want to ask a question. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, you mentioned about digital culture briefly, so maybe we can expand your talk a little bit by answering two other questions. One is that how do you think digital art challenges the concept of what is contemporary and what is new? Because the globalization and digitalization goes hand in hand. And another question is how does it influence the acquisition policy of like contemporary museums like Tate? Because I checked your website saying that your acquisition policy doesn't it's not media specific, but I think there must be something challenges the criteria of the way we receive and accept contemporary art. Thank you. I think there are two um, different questions actually. One would be 
the environment where digital communication is largely uh, changing how we communicate internationally. And the other one is actually digital art as a specific medium in art practice. Um, should I say about both? Yeah, sure. Um, nice. What I said about the digital communication and the um, internet-based, online-based communications, um, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine how we worked for as curators um, when we couldn't Google artists and images. And um, it really does open up some, some aspects of um, information which is very shallow, probably, and superficial at most but um, also linking um, people and information directly. I think the, the question of gatekeepers and um, influencing individuals and in institutions was really quite problematic in um, making access to different cultural productions. So what I'm saying is it is a really different kind of condition now. Everyone has that kind of, um, at least um, on some level, um, the, the direct ways of communicating with different people. And this chart as a medium for, for museums. It, it's, a, um, it's not the easiest media, but it's a really exciting one. And for instance, uh, Tate has now a dedicated space for art of this kind, new media art and performance. Um, in, in the forms of the tanks, which was open briefly at the end of 2012 and had a, quite a dynamic program. I, I couldn't even go to all the performances, but uh, 16 weeks of performance program, which was also very much uh, largely dependent on the, the types of work which are um, new media. And um, something like uh, what Tate does um, as BMW Live program is a kind of interesting experiment about how we encounter live performance without the element of being live. Because it, it is a web-only kind of access um, performance. Artists are invited to perform in a room which is only accessible by cameras. So there is no real audience or a real-time audience of that particular performance, but everyone who are connected to that um, page on the website or at that time become that simultaneous audience. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting area, but um, rather than um, media, medium-specific case approach is to see international art as one uh, sort of large entity, very complicated entity, but rather than having painting curator or prints curator, like in some other museums, it really, um, I think it, it is in a way better to respond to really changing landscapes. Mm -hmm. What's that position, sorry. Um, what is that position as it comes to North Korean art? It's a very primitive level of understanding, really, because North Korean um, art practice is really almost unknown to us. And for the national collection of the UK as a country, the British Museum has started the research and collection of North Korean art. So we are sort of um, relying on their expertise and probably will, because the British Museum, the Victoria now, Museum and Tate do meet, the curators of the international uh, acquisitions do meet to discuss how the UK's national collections should um, be developing in that direction without actually repeating other institutions, special areas. So because the contemporary art in North Korea is largely unknown to the world beyond that country's boundary, we are sort of um, interested but just uh, looking at the right moment to be really engaging in that. Um, 
the, the Whitney Manual that had this uh, path led back to Korea, was that the 1993 one? Was the yes. Yeah. Okay, I saw that in New York. No? Um, I was wondering if you considering that uh, these earlier Korean artists, um, you mentioned it were many work involved with Peter Sachs and Death, um, Chung Kang Jazz, Transparent Balloon, the ones you, you, you put up. It seemed that there were, was already um, something rather like what was going on in that Whitney Biennial as a precedent in Korea in response to, you said, an authoritarian regime. And likewise, in fact, many of the artists in that particular biennial themselves engaged in themes around the body and political work that I would say could easily be traced back to the rather repressive responses to the uh, withdrawal of NEA funding for certain artists in the late 80s. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to why there was such a strong response to that biennial, given that it seems the groundwork was already there in Korea for appreciation for challenging political work. That's really a great question. Probably it wasn't clear in my talk that um, these performances happened in the early 70s. It wasn't really known to um, the public at the time much. And it almost disappeared in the history during the um, late 70s and 80s. And the younger artists who were um, developing as sort of emerging artists never actually knew about these practices. I also learned the, these kind of practices only a few years ago. I didn't even realize that sort of thing happened. Um, they were largely broadcast, uh, largely uh, publicized in yellow journal, sort of uh, tabloid style newspapers. So it wasn't really seriously regarded as art practice, but people just being very silly and being naked in the public for no reason kind of way. So the sort of infiltration of that discourse didn't really happen at that time. And the Whitney Biennial was almost a um, just indicator of what was actually happening in the West, which ensured people that actually these kind of discourses are happening somewhere else too. And because it was happening in New York and it was at the Whitney Museum, they kind of, I think there was a, this, a strange sense of revision of that, um, all of these um, ideas about being marginal and being slightly different and how to define this mainstream and marginal things all kind of came together through that exhibition. I think that was the experience. Rather than the exhibition being just even shocking, um, the reason was really that kind of assurance people were looking for and that kind of uh, place where all the questions could be coming together to really make a different sense of um, artistic pro production they want to probably looking for individually. I, I was looking at the moment when you say that when the, the first group started to call the avant-garde and they, when you described it as a right direction, and but you quoted co that. But can I see the altern I mean, alternative rather than just be going toward the West schools, anything that happened in the West, anything that any critical moment of that, because like, it's, if you are looking from the Western view, like at anything that is coming toward the Western way of seeing the world is becoming popular, seen as a more po more contemporary, and then we name it as a something else. But then, what what is the the alternative language that is produced through the like? Like an alternative languages that might happen as, as, as something uh, like producing an art in different way than somewhere else. It's not just the, the way that because this part is more connected to the Western world, then it have to pub, pub, publicate that we are more connected to the West, and then the other part is just connected to other part of the world, which is not us. Like. Uh, the Korea is going to go to the part which is more, might be more internationally known as 
the other part. But then, how can we judge that that the only resource we take in a, a seriously is the one one which is following the the West schools of Ankara and other things like? Do you think is there is anything that we can call it out, but then it's not the one which is is using the Western idea? I suppose the, the I, I think I I understand your question because it, it seems very much Westernized without much criticism, perhaps for internal negation. Um, I think it, it, it is um, true that. Korea as a society does have a very strong tendency of, in, um, of um, identifying Western as the right or the future. Korean people are very much um, um, optimistic about the future usually as how the technologies are developed so rapidly there because the future is usually a good thing and the future sort of equates with the West and technology industrial size of development in sort of modernity as a civilization's condition. So um, definitely there was a slightly lack of criticism about uh, adopting or assimilating Western languages in artistic production. And a lot of people did um, think about um, how to know quick, quicker what's happening out there. So that sort of um, obtaining information and getting the connections, the direct connections, were a really important part for their learning of what's the future of the art as well. So I think it, it's that sort of um, um, cultural condition that people sort of um, maintained in the past few decades, especially after the Korean War. So from the 60s onward, it has been pretty much the way people regarded um, art, culture, um, other economic, financial developments in a very similar way. But obviously there were some um, critical positions about those things too. And one extreme case was that people's art in Jinjong art. And that obviously was a really strong um, statement about how we can be I mean, differentiated from that, uh, that like homogenizing um, Western discourse in terms of the politics as well as artistic language. So, but it just became very political. I think it was the um, sort of the inherent um, limitation of that particular art. Just they they became as political as the other. They were trying to criticize, and it was quite obvious when the time came with the left wing government they became establishment without hesitance, it seemed. Um, and that sort of a power struggle without actually undermining the power structure itself was probably a, sort of the missed opportunity for that particular historic moment. But um, I would say artistic um, development is very diverse in Korea and like some of the places, and there are artists, especially um, in the current sort of time, um, a lot of different um, directions are explored, and very interesting um, practices are coming out, really. Thank you very much. I saw the Lee Brooks exhibition uh, uh, summer uh, two years ago in Tokyo at Mori Museum, curated by Japanese artists. I found the exhibition quite uh, Koreanness and Koreanization because I think I, I'm Japanese, that's why I could see that. But if you curate Lee Brooks at Tate Modern uh, for the transnationality, like an uh, international audience, how would you interpret? the people's feminism, you know, the identity or uh, translate or your word, uh, didactic contextualization with her work. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Thank you. Sure. That's an interesting proposition. Um, there would be a lot to do that, actually, but <clears throat> what I would do probably is, um, I mean, for those of you who are not really familiar with that practice, the, the image I showed you earlier was, um, the performance 
um, documentation from the late 80s. She, she was a, I mean, I, I kind of grew up with her practice. I, I knew her from my art college, and she was very strange, almost mad woman, who was doing all kinds of um, performances on the street, and she was quite new at the time, because I didn't know that that sort of thing happened in the 70s. So um, I would probably be very interested in emphasizing her, the, the, the role her experimentations played in that particular Korean art history, um, but also looking at some connections um, Rather than influences, I would just say connections and um, similarities and sort of shared or mutual um, interest about the, the notions of body, notions of formativity, and notions of female body as well. So I would really contextualize her with some artists like Louis Bourgeois, Eva Hesse, and um, Chadwick. Um, <coughs> you can really see that didn't really happen with national borders, but some artists, um, female artists, at certain point of their artistic development, they decide to focus on those things, but in a very individualistic way. So I think she, I mean, her work will really enrich the understanding of this um, similar but quite um, diverse uh, practices. Um, Promoted by these women artists. Um, I want to ask a question which emerges from the previous questions really about um, the relationship that Asian art might have in terms of negotiating different aesthetic vocabularies around the visible, the concept of the visible, and it, it links in maybe with um, the performances that were taking place. Um, maybe in Korea, but also the Kuta movement, obviously, in, in Japan, and the equivalent in, in, in China. And it's, it makes me think of the, of the much-quoted um, uh, Borghesian in Chinese encyclopedia um, idea, which Foucault uses as well, this idea of what constitutes the visible and how, how can one identify it, because you did mention this idea of the encyclopedia. And I think you mentioned at one stage the, briefly, the relationship with smoke, uh, fire, and wind. And this idea of a uh, concept of force, which is different maybe to the usual representation of markets of the visible, and how force maybe um, a way of looking at uh, a different way of conceptualizing how there are these non-Western vocabularies, um, which 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 did have quite a, a strong presence, and and which would have interested a lot of people in the 70s and 80s, and uh, you could see how you know that, that, that there was this um, rediscovery, as you said, of previous performance um, practices in Korea. Um, probably maybe thinking about things like that as well, that those, those things became re-problematized, I think, in the, in the 80s especially, coming from certain philosophical positions and looking at Western representational uh, systems and philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. I think the last few years have been, for most curators in museum context, really um, an opportunity to look back the, the recent history of the 20th century art and as you've seen in some exhibitions like the Gutai show at the Guggenheim and um, some Monoha artists like Liu Fan's solo show and Japanese art show um, at the MoMA in New York and, um, and even the Inkart, so looking back the 80s, it, some of the efforts in curatorial field have been about reviewing or revisioning of what's been understood as the 20th century of art. So it is really from this contemporary experience and encouraged by these discoveries of different uh, practices happening now, we are actually able to go back to the origins of these practices happening in different parts of the world now. So because some, some artists like, like I mentioned some may not even have that sort of connection to historic practices that much, but still, there are some certain conditions and um, backgrounds which can actually um, explain a lot about the contemporary practice. Um, and again, by looking back to these um, different legacies of modern art practice in different parts of the world, we are able to really 
undermine that sort of given notions of modernism as very West Central century. It's just realizing that in this very Western century notion was really something we learned. Um, very precious kind of learning would be gained in the past few years. And um, so uh, working as the curator uh, responsible for acquisition of art from Asia, of course there are lots of um, ideological and uh, practical issues of um, collecting art, and especially for contemporaryism. Tate is not really exactly a museum, so it's all about contemporary um, practice and how to define contemporary. Obviously, that, that is why the, my talk was about how to really understand the contemporary um, when thinking about other cultures. Um, Asia itself is very diverse, too. I, I, I am from that region, but my understanding is also limited. Um, as any other individuals might be, but also from that um, imaginary, sort of almost imaginary notion of Asia itself it is now questioned and how to relate Asia to other parts of the world, non-Western parts, such as Latin America, Africa, um, Middle East. That, that, that really becomes um, a sort of task for us to um, continue. Thank you. So again, uh, very much for your presentation. Uh, next week, we'll have Har Kegel here and then a couple of his reading week. Um, so please, uh, a, a big thank you to us. And we're going to the bar as usual.